Heavenly Father, our focused gaze is upon the finish line. And we do not want to quit before we finish. And so I pray tonight that you would quicken our steps, strengthen our hearts, and cause us to be committed to Jesus and to the gospel even more so. Bless the time and the word for that purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4. I have one verse. Second Timothy chapter 4. That verse is verse 7. And normally verses 7 and 8 go together uh, in this chapter. And that's a, that's a good way to consider this. Um, it would be appropriate to read both those verses together. But I am captured by verse 7. Let me make a couple of contextual comments before I read 2 Timothy 4, 7 and talk to you under the title of Fight, Finish, and Be Faithful. Fight, Finish, and Be Faithful. Paul is looking back. That's not necessarily a bad thing to do. Sometimes it can be a bad thing to do if you ought to be looking ahead. But in this case, Paul is looking back because he is coming to the end of his earthly life. He knows that his life is over or almost over. He says in verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. The word departure means death. Departure means leaving here, earth, for there, heaven. And in Philippians 1, he said he, his desire was to do that. He was willing to stay on earth and serve, but he really wanted to go home. And he was getting ready to go home. Thus, it's in the context of his coming to the end of his earthly life and work that Paul is looking back. He is reviewing his life, but I want to make it clear. I do not think Paul is bragging. I don't think Paul is showing off here. Paul is just sharing his heart in an honest, realistic straightforward way the other thing that he's doing as he reflects back on his life and his work he is i think teaching this young pastor what is important he's writing to a young pastor named timothy and he's saying to timothy as i'm coming to the end of my life here are the things that are prominent to me in my thinking Thus, he is saying to him, when you come to the end of your journey, this is what's going to be important to you. Keep that in mind as you make choices tomorrow. So with that in mind, I want to read verse 7, and I have some other related passages that I want to point out as we go along. Paul says, and notice the past tense verbiage. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. This is athletic imagery. Jot down if you would like some further thoughts on this, it, particularly in Paul's mind, 1 Corinthians 9 verses 24 through 27, where he talks about running, but he also talks about boxing. He talks about doing the Christian life as an athletic event that requires everything we have to, get, to give it. That's in his mind here. 
I think he also has in mind Ephesians 6, where he says, put on the armor of God. Because we are battling against spiritual entities and forces and powers. When he says, I have fought a good fight, he has literally been fighting. He says, I have finished the race. Uh, if you recall, you can jot down for later review in the 20th chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 20. Paul is talking to some pastors from Ephesus. And, and this is what he says to them. Now I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me, that is, in Jerusalem. But, he writes, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I think that is what he has in mind here in these final days of his life. His desire was to finish. And he was closing in on that moment. I finished the race. And third, he says, I have kept the faith. And, and I, by the way, sometimes the word faith in the New Testament is used in a subjective sense. That is to say, I have faith in Christ, right? I believe in Jesus. That's my faith. That is subjective faith. But when the definite article is used with faith in the New Testament, the faith, it's not talking about having faith in Jesus. It's talking about the faith that is the gospel and the doctrines of the gospel. So everything that's packed into what the gospel teaches is housed in the faith. So he is saying here, I have kept faithful to the teaching of, of the gospel, my entire ministry. That's what he's saying. Now I want to take a look at these three parts of his life that are so important to him to fight well and finish well and be faithful to the end to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thus, three things I want to point out to you. And this is us. I'm, I'm sharing this as, as an autobiographical challenge to myself. And I'm sharing it as a challenge to you. One, if Christians are to succeed in living out our faith, it will be because we learn to fight well. If we are to succeed in living out our faith, It'll be because we learn to fight well. Now, there are all kinds of things. That could be a sermon in and of itself. And I would say a number of important things to you about this. First of all, learn what battles to fight. Some people just want to fight about everything. Jerry Falwell Sr. Some of you remember knowing about Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia. Moral majority, that guy. And he was an independent Baptist. Have any of you ever been an independent Baptist? Do any of you know any independent Baptists? They love to fight. And Jerry, I heard him say one time, he said, I'm happiest when I'm fighting something. And he was being honest about that. He always had to have a battle to fight. But I want to caution you. Not every battle is worth fighting. Pick your battles well. There are some battles you need to not worry about to win the war. All right? 
Some battles strike at the very heart of what the gospel is about, and we better fight them. But even if we fight a battle that's worth fighting, we, re- we need to remember we're fighting it the way Jesus would have us to fight it. And this is a concern that I've got. There's a growing trend in American evangelical Christianity that we need to rise up with guns and fight the Lord's battles. Ladies and gentlemen, guns will not help us fight the Lord's battles. That's not how we fight. Let me show you how I know that. If you have your finger in 2 Timothy 4, leave it there and turn to 2 Corinthians 10. This is where I get that. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is as clear as it can be. Paul says, as Christians, we fight the Lord's battles not with fleshly weapons or weapons of the flesh waging war according to the flesh. Our battle is the battle of ideas. We must preach the truth. We must take the truth to people. And when you do that, you are engaging in warfare in Satan's domain. That's something we need to remember. Be very cautious that you do not fight the wrong battle or fight the right battle in the wrong way. Let me mention a couple other things. We we can't spend a long time on this first point. But the battle is bigger than you think because it includes your own heart. We all know that there are three enemies. They are the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world system, you cannot make peace with the world system as a church because the world system is against God. And James 4, verse 4, says to be a friend with the world is to be an enemy of God. But you cannot make peace with your own flesh. There is still a, what Paul calls a sin principle, even within his life and yours and mine, that will rise up against God. We have to fight that. That's called the flesh. And then there's the devil. We need to remember it's a big battle. It involves many different fronts. But we must not give in to despair in the battle. I sometimes sense Christians giving up. Dare I say it, I sometimes feel like giving up myself. I'm done. There's nothing I can do. The the battle's too big. I don't have enough resources. But we can't quit, can we? We have to keep fighting well because a day will come when our life comes to a conclusion where we will want to say with Paul, I fought a good fight. Number two, if Christians are to succeed in living out our faith, it will be because we refuse to quit. We refuse to quit. This is a different thing than fighting. It's coming to the point where you just want to give up. I got a book in the mail many years ago now, and I read a portion of it, and quite frankly, it wasn't that good. But I loved the title. And the title of this book was Don't Quit Before You're Done. And I thought a long time about, by the way, the book was about pastors not quitting before they finish their work. Christians need to remember that we are not given the privilege of deciding when we're done. Now, your life situation can change. 
And I want to be cautious to say that it's okay to make life changes in your life. But as you, as you move from one phase to another as God leads, you will always need to remember that you're still a Christian. And as a Christian, you still have work to do. Dare I say it? You will be alive until your work is done. And God will take you home. We oftentimes will say when someone dies, their work was finished. And I think that is true. Paul, when he came to the end of his life, he could honestly say he did not quit. I did not quit, he could say, before I finished the race. Hebrews 12.1 says, we are to run with patience, endurance, steadfastness, the race that is set before us. People will sometimes quit by giving up hope on the gospel itself. The devil seems to be in control and charge of so much that we give up hope that God can and will break through. Discouragement, passivity, in fact, no joy. I see joyless Christians all around. People who are grumpy, people who are discouraged, who've given into despair. They've lost hope and thus they've lost joy. Is this not quitting? Sometimes people quit by giving up their belief in the gospel. I was asked to do a Q&A recording for our young people, which I did, on deconstruction. There is a trend in our day, particularly of young people who claim to be Christian and then they deconstructed their faith. Really, they, it means they quit being a Christian. And it's a growing trend. Did, did you know that? It's a growing trend of people who come out of the faith. This is quitting. Quitting on God. Quitting on the Bible. Quitting on Jesus. Quitting on the gospel. We cannot succeed in living out our faith if we quit on God and the truth. Sometimes folks quit by giving up on their participation in furthering the gospel. It is true, and it should be acknowledged. As we get older, now I don't know what that means, but I've heard others talk about it. As you get older, you can't do what you used to do. Does that mean you give up trying to do anything? Rather, believers should think like this. I want to do what I can with what I have for the gospel as long as I'm able. It may change what I can do. But I will not quit trying to do something for Christ, to speak for Christ, to pray for the lost to pray for the pastor and the pastoral staff and the church. I will refuse to quit. Paul said, I have finished the race. Oh, that we could come to a point in our lives when at the end of this earthly sojourn, we can say with him, I have finished the race. Third, I have kept the faith. If Christians are to succeed in living out our faith, it'll be because we keep the faith. And I wish I could spend more time, an hour at least, on this part of it. We are, I think, watching the church deconvert from the faith. We are doing that in a number of ways. We're changing what we talk about in the church to something other than the gospel, stuff we make up that we think fits with the gospel, but is not the gospel. You can't keep the faith if you give up on the faith. We keep the faith by keeping the true teaching of the gospel alive. There is a passion in my personal heart 
to be true to the gospel doctrines and pass it along to you so that you, in turn, can pass it along to somebody else. The day will come when we will not be here. Is there not a burden in our hearts that this church, when you and I are no longer here, will still be preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ? We got work to do to make sure that happens as much as we can. We must keep the faith. And that, that doesn't just mean embrace a wrong teaching, and, and we refuse to do that, but it, it means we talk about the true gospel all the time. Keep it alive. When people hear us share joyfully, is it about the truth of the gospel? The day will come, I guarantee you, for each one of us. When we come to the end of our lives, we'll be glad when we say, if we're able to say, I kept the faith. Application and conclusion. I have several things to say in this area. First, the Christian life is an active life that demands all we can give. The Christian life is an active life that demands all we can give. I remember my own calling. I just felt such a passion, such a powerful energy. I wanted to save the world by Friday. And I guess I tried on occasion to do that. By the way, it didn't work. But in my exuberance, my youthful exuberance, there was this passion to be busy for the Lord. I think the Christian life is an active life, no matter what your health is. It's an active life. It takes energy. It takes intentionality. It takes planning. It takes purpose. It takes effort. And Paul talks about that a lot in his teaching on sanctification in the New Testament. Number two, there's an end coming to this life. There's an end coming to this life, and what we do now will matter in the end. There's an end coming. Did you know there's a finish line out there somewhere? Did you know that? I don't know where mine is. You don't know where yours is, but it's out there. It's coming. Each day we live, we're getting closer and closer to the finish line. This day, this life, as we're experiencing it now, will not continue forever. And what we do now will matter when we get to that point. So we live each day with the end in view. That's something to keep in mind. Thirdly, it's worth living for Jesus as a Christian. And eternity will compensate. Now, uh, I, I kind of cheated on this point because I have in mind the next verse here. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to also all who have loved his appearing. Brothers and sisters in Christ, does it matter whether or not we live for Jesus? Does it matter whether or not we hold to the faith? Is it important whether or not we seek to honor Him in all things? The Scripture says it does matter. And whether we feel like we're a success or not isn't important. What matters is what God says about us. And no matter what we go through in this life, when we get to heaven, we will surely say, whatever I went through on earth, it was worth it. It was worth it. To fight the good fight, to finish the race, and to keep the faith. May God help us to be more inspired and committed to do just that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. Those who are discouraged, want to give up, want to quit. 
those who want to compromise the gospel for some other ideas they've heard about that seem compelling. Help us to resist the trends of the day, the pull of our own flesh, and the arguments of the devil to fight the good fight, finish the course, and be faithful till death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.